Hey folks, now that I've spent a bunch of videos explaining the best starting point for assessing any claim or topic, the scientific consensus, and have discussed the ways in which ideology and common cognitive biases cause us to deny science, it's time to delve into understanding the system under which science operates. And that is the peer review system, whereby scientists publish their findings in scientific journals that are set up to allow other scientists to scrutinize their work. Peer review is employed through all of modern science so as to maintain a high, consistent quality of work that is published for other scientists to attempt to replicate or refute. A few useful free resources for searching the peer-reviewed scientific literature include the following. Google Scholar, one of the most comprehensive search engines that includes most online journals. PubMed, a free online search engine of citations mostly from life science journals and biomedical topics, and NCBI, a series of databases run as part of the U.S. National Library of Medicine. There are many more search engines that specialize in searching specific fields of science. If a scientific question or topic has been studied to any serious degree, it will appear in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Why is it important for evidence to be published in good quality peer-reviewed journals? Peer review serves in the best of times as a bias filter to ensure that only the absolute best conducted studies are published. Without rigorous studies that are designed to control for sources of bias, we don't have a reliable way of answering questions of what hypotheses are supported and which aren't, of ultimately what works and what doesn't. It must be highlighted that anecdotes or our personal experiences are not significant, other than potentially leading us to ask a question and develop a hypothesis. Such anecdotes must be robustly backed by experimental data if you see someone promoting a drug, a treatment, or anything based on their personal experience, you should understand all of the cognitive biases that could be potentially affecting a person's judgment, and you should demand proper scientific evidence to substantiate their claims. Evidence in the way of rigorous scientific studies in reputable peer-reviewed journals. So how can we hope to evaluate a scientific paper or scientific issue or claim without expertise in the field. Well, to be frank, this is beyond the scope of most of us who weren't trained in a specific field. Luckily, there are certain questions we can ask and a mental checklist we can apply in order to help us make sense of the science. I'm going to focus generally on the medical field since this provides a more accessible gateway to understanding these issues. Likely, the most important question we can ask is what type of study are we dealing with? Some studies are better than others. In Trisha Greenhalge's book, How to Read a Paper, The Basics of Evidence-Based Medicine, she discusses a rough hierarchy of the types of studies to look for when reviewing the scientific literature. At the top are meta-analyses, or systematic reviews of a group of studies within a particular field. These are so valuable because, rather than relying on single studies here and there, Researchers will group data together in a large meta-analysis, or literature review, to see how patterns and models hold in the larger picture. The Cochrane Collaboration is widely regarded as the gold standard for conducting these types of reviews. The British Medical Journal's Clinical Evidence website presents systematic reviews in easy, quick-to-access formats. It should be noted, however, that the meta-analysis, like all science, is not bulletproof or immune to its flaws. For example, a 2010 meta-analysis in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition concluded that there is no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease, which is in stark contrast to the scientific consensus on the topic. This study was found to have serious problems and was immediately criticized for its many methodological and statistical flaws. Likewise, a 2013 systematic review and meta-analysis in JAMA concluded that grade one obesity, the lowest level of obesity, overall was not associated with higher mortality and overweight was associated with significantly lower all-cause mortality. Once again, 
This review suffered from all sorts of methodological problems and has essentially been refuted in post-publication peer review. If a meta-analysis reviews poor studies, the wrong studies, or uses statistical methods that obscure the individual study's findings, the value of such a review is lost. In fact, there is evidence that meta-analyses are not predictive of subsequent large-scale randomized clinical trials about 35% of the time. I'll discuss the issues of what can go wrong in science in a later video. It should be noted that meta-analyses and systematic reviews are not novel studies in that they don't involve the conducting of new experiments to add to the data pool. Instead, they group results together from studies already conducted and present a broad picture as to what all these data mean cumulatively. Beyond meta-analyses and systematic reviews, we have randomized controlled trials, which are essential in medicine or any other field where there is the ability to control certain variables in order to test a hypothesized drug, treatment, or other intervention. In general, the best randomized controlled trial designs will, one, have a randomized representative sample of subjects that is large enough to detect an effect, two, have a treatment group that receives the experimental drug or treatment being tested, and a control group that receives a placebo or the current standard of treatment to see if the experimental treatment is better. Three, be double-blinded, meaning the subjects and the experimenters do not know who is receiving the real treatment versus the placebo or other treatment. Four, be long-term enough to detect possible effects and side effects. Five, wherever possible, control for any confounding variables or rather other influences that may affect the results of the study. And lastly, six, should set an endpoint to measure or rather look at one outcome to focus on before running the study. Failure to do this allows researchers to sift through many outcomes until they find statistically significant findings of their choosing and report on those, a phenomenon known as p-hacking, which I'll explain in video 5.3 on what can go wrong with scientific studies. While randomized controlled trials are indeed the gold standard for scientific studies, sometimes they're not possible. For example, you cannot expose a group of subjects to a suspected or known carcinogen, as that is clearly unethical. Or it may simply be impractical for logistical or cost reasons to conduct such large-scale controlled interventions. Therefore, scientists have many other study designs that they can use. Moving down the hierarchy of evidence from randomized controlled trials, we have different types of observational or epidemiological studies. There are cohort studies, which typically follow two groups of people, one which, for example, is exposed to a hypothesized or known risk factor, and one which is not, and followed over time. Prospective cohort studies do this from the present into the future, and retrospective cohort studies look at historical data. These would be useful to examine questions relating to whether, say, a widespread behavior in a population is harmful or not. Say whether the use of cell phones increases rates of cancer. Case control studies are outcome-based. Outcomes of interest are identified as cases and controls are selected, say exposures or risk factors that may affect the outcome. These are much quicker and cheaper than cohort studies and work well to study rare outcomes. Perhaps the most famous triumph of these types of studies was in the eventual demonstration that smoking causes lung cancer. The causal link was later confirmed through cohort studies. Cross-sectional studies gather data from a given population subset and seek to find relationships between variables at a specific point in time which would later have to be investigated more rigorously. And finally, case reports and case series are simply detailed reports of an individual patient. Each of these study designs can work in a complementary way. For example, with enough case reports of a specific outcome, a hypothesis could be generated, which could be expanded upon via a cross-sectional study. General trends of a population could then be observed to test more specifically via case control studies, to cohort studies to test the effects over time, 
and finally, if feasible, via experimental trials or randomized controlled trials that would yield the strongest evidence. Following from the type of study, we should ask ourselves, how much evidence is there altogether? If meta-analyses and literature reviews haven't been done, and there's no clear scientific consensus, we should be particularly concerned with the volume and quality of evidence that exists for any particular topic. Obviously, the more the better. It may surprise you to find out that a lot of what gets published in the peer-reviewed literature are preliminary findings that are not replicated, which means we can't be very confident that these initial findings are reliable. Therefore, if you can only find a single study with a specific finding, your search should definitely not stop there. Remember, science is a messy process, and it is often difficult to control for what are called confounding variables, or influences that go unaccounted for, that affect our results. This is why replication of scientific findings, and even more, replication to the extent that a scientific consensus emerges, is so important and valuable to the progress of science. I'll discuss what has been termed by some as the replication crisis in a later video in this sub-series. Next item of concern, the reputability of journals. We need to consider something called impact factor. Impact factor is a measure that reflects the number of citations that recent articles in a journal have. The higher, the more reputable, though there are certainly issues with the metric. But we must understand, peer review is just a minimum. Findings in peer review need to be replicated numerous times to ensure accuracy of a finding or model so that a topic can be addressed from various different angles with different study parameters and so forth. The more evidence that's generated and the more consistent the findings, the more robust a finding likely is. For example, if we're trying to research the efficacy of a drug, we should consider to discover whether any clinical trials have been completed that demonstrate whether a drug has been more successful in its proposed treatment compared to a placebo or older drug. The more successful ones and the fewer unsuccessful ones, the better. The last major item I'll put on this checklist is what could have gone wrong with the study. And this is where I'll pause because this subject really deserves its own video. I'm going to cover this not in the next video, but in the one after that. In the next video, we're going to take a look at some basic concepts in statistics that will help in your navigation of scientific claims. I hope you will join me there. Thanks for watching.